Bom dia a todos. Everyone. Estamos aqui dando início a mais um evento na área de infraestrutura, capitaneado pelo SECAP, né? o nosso eh, grupo de altos estudos relativos à infraestrutura no âmbito do Tribunal de Contas da União. Eu queria agradecer muito a presença de todos hoje nesse evento, um evento de extrema importância, um tema bastante relevante e palpitante no nosso país, tomada de decisões em mega projetos de infraestrutura. Eu tenho a alegria de, então, já para dar início, passar a palavra para o nosso ministro Benjamin Zimmer, um ministro que tem uma, uma atenção muito grande com o tema da infraestrutura, é um entusiasta desse tema. Então, já gostaria de iniciar passando a palavra para o ministro Benjamin Zimmer. Ministro, por favor, seja bem-vindo. Muito obrigado, Nicola. Bom dia a todos. Eu gostaria de cumprimentar a todos os virtualmente presentes, aos servidores do TCU e aos demais órgãos da administração pública que nos acompanham, em especial os ilustres palestrantes de hoje, o professor da Universidade de Oxford, Bent Flubiar, o diretor de projeto de infraestrutura do governo do Reino Unido, Javier Encinas, e o secretário interino de desenvolvimento da infraestrutura do Ministério da Economia, Pedro Capelupi. É uma honra para o Tribunal de Contas da União termos os senhores conosco nesta manhã. E a minha saudação, ela também é realizada em nome do nosso presidente, né, ministro José Múcio Monteiro, que não pôde okay. participar do evento e me deu a honra de substituí-lo. É, esse evento está sendo transmitido em português okay. e em inglês pelo canal do TCU no YouTube. Então, saúdo também todos os cidadãos brasileiros que nos acompanham, e os colegas de outros países que vão assistir às discussões de hoje e interagir com os palestrantes por meio de perguntas no chat. Começamos, então, mais um webinar do TCU sobre um tema de extrema relevância e bastante custoso, especialmente para o nosso país, processo de tomada de decisões em mega projetos de infraestrutura, é de conhecimento de todos que o Brasil tem dimensões continentais, all, all, abundância de recursos of general knowledge for all that Brasil has continents of 210 milhões de habitantes espalhada por todo o território spread all over the national territory. Para possibilitar that... a locomoção dessas pessoas, a prestação de serviços. And in order to provide the transportation of these people, high class uh, transportation, quality transportation, water, sanitation, for example, are necessary. I mean, takes um, mega infrastructure projects of engineering. These projects that uh, the Brazilians are used to, for example, the integration of São Francisco, uh, refinery Abreu e Lima, the port of Santos, nuclear power plant of Angra 3, among others. However, we have become used to hear about these projects, not because of their deliveries and successes, but because of their problems, the problems in which investments are not made properly, because of the difficulty in delivering, and also because of problem of corruption and fund deviations. In the most remarkable and sad examples, one of the most re remarkable cases is Abreu e Lima refinery, known as the Northeast refinery, in Eu Pernambuco. And I am the rapporteur of many of the processes that deal with the issue of construction, as well as the decisions made that allowed for the conclusion of the refinery Abreu e Lima. And I give you as an example a cordon 2667, in which I was the rapporteur that I talked about over uh, cost overrun, and there were managers of Petrobras and two contracting companies were sued in the sense of giving back 1.9 billion reais to the Brazilian uh, taxpayers. We're talking about the, the unit of uh, atmospheric oscillation and treatment. These are uh, contracts that add up to billions of reais, uh, more than a billion, or something close to two billion reais. There are also problems in the constructions in the mega projects, which allowed for a lot of damage or inexpenditure to the Brazilian taxpayers. Another process that needs to be highlighted is a project from 2015, which the court sought to seek the implementation 
implementation of Renert. This is a very complex project that was, I mean, that is still ongoing. Two weeks ago, there was a decision that uh, took to the application of sanctions to many managers, but which also determined that the debt be assessed through the implementation of TC due to wrongful decisions in the management of the Abreu and Lima uh, refinery. This refinery was originally conceived to drain the oil from, from Venezuela, which is very rich in sulfur. And there were some specific units. So this is why a project uh, was created of this uh, refinery with two with treatment uh, units, treatment, I mean, treatment for uh, atmospheric os oscillation. I mean, some of these projects were discontinued because no oil from Venezuela was refined or will be refined he, within a vision of long-term project. The fact is, the construction of this project came from a wrongful decision, thinking that there would, there would be this Brazil-Venezuela project, which this pact, which never was carried out. The problem is not that the pact was, the problem is that it never uh, was, this pact was never made to, to approve or to I state for the decisions that were made before. Another example of long term of big constructions with problem of planning and integration and operationalization is the project of integration of San Francisco River. This is also another project in which I was the repertoire of the analysis of the studies of ability of the basic project. I don't remember very well. I, mean, I remember very well that we summoned the minister Ciro Gomes and other managers, governors, to discuss the project, and we noticed a lack of uh, planning and the studies seem to be precarious. Very, you know, very shallow fashion. Everything was very done very in a very simplistic fashion. So when we make a comparison between the construction of locks or or, or canals such as it is done today, in comparison with the desalinization of water of the sea, and the truth is, the study had a technical tie in terms of proposals. And there were also political uh, deficit in terms of decision making, which showed that this project was born with problem. And what really surprises us is that to this day, this project has not been completed. There has been an investment of 16 billion, and I remember 60 billion reais, but originally the project was, uh, the, the project should cost 4 billion reais, and by itself, that is not enough to make water available for the Northeast. We need horizontal construction for the draining of the water, which is led to suffer to, to the northeast. We need to build dams, and these dams are not, these constructions are not being made. So how can we then avoid that, uh, stop these problems from happening, and how can we ensure the delivery of quality service to our population? The Court of Accounts also plays a very important role in its quest to solutions for such problems. But once again, I say that the Court of Accounts is a player that is in a in a complex context that involves companies and powers and regulating agencies and organizations that take the responsibility of carrying construction uh, into account, the, the court needs to know its role in the decision-making process and also the decision-making role of the decision-makers, as well as support institutes that allow for 
the private companies to bring their natural efficiency to help the state in the conception of projects of infrastructure that still needs to be used with more intensity, uh, the process of manifesting manifestation of interest, which allows for uh, companies to be enabled to deliver studies and projects that can be used by the, the state. And upon doing that, they can participate in the, in the bidding process of the construction. Furthermore, there is a whole normative process that, that seeks to with the market and private company putting Brazil away from this idea of centralizing all the competences in in the central government. I mean, not only the part of studying regulation, but even in the execution of many important constructions. Out of the constructions that I have mentioned, where we had problems, the Abreu e Lima refinery was built by Petrobras, the integration of San Francisco River was built by the federal government, so this, the action of the court is dialectic, is difficult, which is made with some ups and downs. The court recognizes that it does not own the truth. Actually, our role is to interact with many different organs, organizations that have a much deeper knowledge of the subject. Therefore, our competence is to bring hypotheses, call for uh, reflections so that the planning study is carried out in a more efficient and optimized fashion by the action of our teams and the minister. Inspection of, federal constru of constructions with federal funds is one of our duties, and we have been doing that for many years, 24 years actually, through a system called Fiscobra which is a system in which we do an x-ray of public constructions or some public constructions. We identify irregularity. We're able to to ensure, uh, to make sure that the funds are discontinued by the National Congress when constructions have some, some level of inaccuracy. We allow for the correction of our problems. And this is probably one of the greatest benefits that we render. Where we find when we find irregularity, we can notice the facts to the organizations that are responsible for the constructions, and they can very quickly, in some cases, uh, incur in the solution of the problems. And furthermore, the court of accounts through a process that was related by Minister Vital do Rego, analyzed 38,000 contracts in 2018 and saw that 14,000 of them were actually halted. Any study in Brazil that uses public data bank has a problem because our data banks do not always reflect the reality. For the, catalog, for the cataloging of data, they need a lot of premises that are not rationalized sometimes. Just to give you an example, we've done an update of this assessment to reduce to 25,000 contracts, and we verified that there were uh, 7,000 contracts that were actually halted. When we compare with the first analysis, when we compare the analysis, we could deduce that there, deduce that there was a decrease of 50% of the constructions. But that does not mean an improvement in the respective public uh, measures. This is more, I mean, this, is ha this happens because of, this happens for change in the contract, in the management of data bank. What is a halted construction? It is actually something that can be defined from different premises. premises when premises change, numbers change. Well, this issue can be finished because the Court of Accounts since 2007 demands that there is an implementation of a general registry of government constructions. This determination has not yet been implemented. We have been, we have been discussing the issue for many for many for a long time, but there was a, a decision from this court that we seek for the where we enforce the implementation of the national calendar of federal constructions. 
Well, this is just a quick overview of this scenario. I gave you examples that were interesting to me, and as usual, and in spite of the problems, it's, it's important to mention that there are good examples of efficiency in the Brazilian uh, state. Unfortunately, however, the final result does not seem to be interesting. The, there are failures that seem to go beyond the, the decisions. I mean, the, 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 the failures go beyond the results in this process. So this is why we are here sponsoring this webinar, because of its importance and its interest. It is important that we have a solid infrastructure of, of compliance as well as harmony decisions that harmonize with the, the desires of the population and of course that will be translated in great delivery more important than the compliance system what is important is to operationalize because in many cases in Brazil there is a modism or fashion fashionism and there is a fad in compliance o órgão nem sabe se esses sistemas estão operando, se eles estão sendo operacionalizados e, afinal, são eficientes para melhorar... They are efficient to improve the, the improvement of the mega projects of infrastructure. Well, we want to drink from the international source. This is why we've invited people who have great qualifications. And this is why I declare this event open and I... Wish you all a great event. I wish you all a wonderful webinar. Thank you very much. Minister Zimas, thank you very much for the kind words and for the opening, bringing great examples of great uh, constructions and the size of the problem that our country still faces. I would like to bring two more examples, Mr. Minister, to complement what you said, showing that the trouble is actually much bigger, because even when we talk about mega constructions, they also face problems, right? For example, the health units. We have a lot of health units for the health unit or for the health arena. These are most small constructions that have been started. Sometimes they have been finished, but they're not operational because there was no uh, planning in the, in the uh, buy-in of furniture or even of hiring of people. And sometimes the municipality does not have the funds for that. So we're talking about mega constructions, but even the small constructions have to deal with bad planning. And this is why the functionality of the construction is compromised. And another example that I would like to bring and discuss with you in terms of care that Minister Zimmer mentioned so effusively I would like to bring an example of a uh, work that was done regarding uh, construction in a road in Santa Catarina in which the court issued a cautious measure suspending a bidding due to, in the same state, roads that are close to this road that could uh, be good for that stretch. These constructions were not ongoing because of lack of funds. So there were two constructions that were being executed for lack of funds, but the same organization wanted to do the, a third bidding for another part of that same road, placing there 18% of the budget uh, forecast for that year. In other words, not even the, for, not even the budget for that construction was there. In other words, they wanted to get another 18% of the funds of that, of that year. So we're talking about a free decision of the, of the decision maker to start a third uh, construction with only 18% of funds of Available when they had already two constructions, they were not ongoing because of lack of funds in the same state. So the court decided to adopt an accord from Minister Sherman, suspending the bidding. At the time, there was a great discussion regarding whether or not the court was getting into the limit of the action, the arena of the manager, but the local manager. But I believe that there was a very 
very cautious decision with a lot of zeal for the good application of public funds. So these are two examples of other, of two more constructions when it comes to the boundaries of the actions of the, of the court. So I'd like to hand the floor to our coordinator of general infrastructure. And we have a secretary here that deals specifically with projects and processes that came out of the car wash operation. I mean, we have a specific unit for that. And Secretary Rafael Di Bello will uh, add to that. So, Di Bello, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nicola. Good morning, everyone. While I show you a presentation, I'd like to greet everyone. Ministro Benjamin Zimler, Min na pessoa do Nicola, Benjamin da Coinfra, é, e também os nossos convidados, palestrantes, professor Bente Clubiar, professor Javier Encinas, doutor Pedro Capelupi, todos Pedro conseguem Capilupi. enxergar a apresentação? Can everyone see the presentation? Ainda não, de Bela. Ainda yet. não? Me desculpe, deixa eu retornar. I'm sorry, let me go back. Agora sim. All right, can you see it? Não. Estão conseguindo enxergar? Não, não apareceu. No, we cannot see it. Agora sim. No, and what Agora about sim. now? Yes. Não está em tela cheia. Agora está. Agora está ok. Muito obrigado a todos. Okay, então, saudando you, a todos. Rapidamente, nós somos das Cinfra Operações, como so bem colocou o Nicola, é, somos da Coinfra, é, e o objetivo da unidade é combater e prevenir a corrupção e infraestrutura, e atuamos, cuidamos dos casos da Lava Jato. É, apresentaremos um projeto de habilidade em foco, que é desenvolvido em parceria com a GIZ, financiadora alemã, a quem, desde logo, eu agradeço pela, pela, pelo apoio. É, temos é, a apresentação, quem cuida é, dessa, dessa, desse tema, Lá na Secretaria da Davi Grupa, que é o nosso professor, Gruba, our e professor. vamos adiante numa rápida apresentação. O projeto ele surgiu, o projeto de habilidade em foco so surgiu a partir de uma ideia premiada no Reconhecer, que é uma, um prêmio do Tribunal de Contas da União, em 2017, a parceria com a GIZ busca o levantamento das melhores práticas nacionais e internacionais, e junto com os consultores, professor Leomar da USP e professor Rajão da FMG, são os convidados. Esse prêmio reconhecido em 2017, ele se baseou muito no... Foi a base fundamental do trabalho. E aí foram dois artigos citados em 2002 e 2006 nesse trabalho que é o, o, o foco da nossa apresentação. Primeiro, rapidamente, o problema. Qual o problema que nós temos, né? É, our problem, a quick example is our stadium for the World Cup cost 50% more. This is a uh, report from 2014, and it was a target of crimes as cartels. Managarincha, our national stadium in Brasilia, cost almost the double of what it was supposed to cost. And the reform of all the stadiums went from five Five billion to more than eight billion, and they're considered great uh, white elephants. This is our problem because there was a great cost over one. So. The refinery of Northeast region was also a target of a great number of audits from the court. In 2016, from the Court of Accounts, shows clearly beyond the cost over one of billions of reais that the initial project, the initial prediction uh, was seven billion dollars, but it went to 19 billion. This Infeasibility corresponds to almost 100 billion reais. It would be enough to make 12 times the the, the number of stadiums. So we could be able to do it 12 times. So this shows the magnitude of our problem. So we have uh, the most superficial layer of the problem. We will approach corruption later, uh, which is which is bribing. Uh, we also have uh, overpricing. But many times we can 
can see is the unfeasibility of the project, which is the reality of many uh, projects. And if we got the cycle of quality, which is PDCA, which is plan to check and act to improve that, we would have here a problem in a vicious cycle. When we take a look at this unfeasibility, we want a virtual cycle instead. Better location of resources, as Nicola said, uh, we initiate unnecessary uh, projects and it takes uh, resources out of the necessary projects. As Nicola said, the unities of health units have many problems, such as calls of FNDA. So corruption, strategic misrepresentation, as Fluvia says, as he said back in 2008, is a deliberate misrepresentation of fake data in a way that you underestimate the costs, overestimate the benefits, so you can make the project feasible. The one that estimates correctly with cost deadlines and benefits well defined, uh, it ends up being pushed away from the market and is beaten by the ones that misrepresents the studies, which the focus end up being to inaugurate something that we call the, uh, the, the cornerstone. And the competition for resources uh, so the, the project that seems to be more viable uh, is not actually that viable and ends up bringing the resources. And the project of viability and focus also tries to evaluate that. Barusco was the ex-manager of services at Petrobras, well known at car wash operation, and he gave back 180 million reais. This was the value of the bribes he, he used to have in bank accounts abroad. So bribe ends up being an investment for those who wish to misrepresent the studies, and this leads to overpricing and an illegitimate uh, profit. This website of G1 shows the gaining of bribe, uh, overpricing projects, loss to pay less taxes. And I also want to show you uh, this, this, this movie from Netflix, Laundromat, with, because it shows uh, car wash in Brazil. If a corrupt person gained a value from the project, a bribe, why would he make it not possible because the more he wins the more the greater the bribe the more he wins this is why uh, feasibility and focus tries to picture in the uk a thing that encinas will show to you in the sequence, we have reference class forecasting which is the world of flubiar uh, 5k's model approaches uh, commercial, financial management, economic and strategic cases, which Javier and Sinas will approach. I have reference class forecasting, which seeks to improve estimatives and forecasts based on previous experience. In an article of 2017, which won, which won the Reconhecer Award, they approach uh, Flubia which opposes the traditional thought of complex projects focusing on details and unique characteristics of the project would be called the internal view, the internal point of view, which ends up leading to uh, an optimistic and misrepresented forecast. And reference class forecasting uh, lead leads to creating a systematic evaluation and assessment of the projects, which leads to better results. Daniel Kahneman, which won the Nobel Prize of Economy, he talks about reference class forecasting also in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow. He mentions uh, Dr. Fubia and the decision makers need to verify uh, realistically the costs and benefits before making a decision about the project, as Nicola said. 
in the example where they only had 88% of the resources to make a project. So without fighting against the predictable inefficiency in the allocation of resources, the money of the taxpayer will never be enough to develop infrastructure in Brazil. The executives need to take decisions and make the necessary projects, but they should do it responsibly and respecting the accountability to the society. I thank you, Nicola, and let's continue. Thank you, Gibello. I would like to thank the councillor Robson Braga and his presence. We have here in the Federal Court of Accounts, composed by great councillors that are not from the actual Federal Court of Account, but we open to those to receive uh, criticism and feedbacks, and I would like to thank his presence. We're in a final stage. We will have a final stage of uh, Q&As. So our colleagues that are watching us in the YouTube channel, you can make questions so we can present. Que é diretor de projetos de infraestrutura do Reino Unido, é vice-chefe da Divisão Internacional da Autoridade de Infraestrutura e Projetos do Reino Unido. Ele é especializado em infraestrutura e finanças. Ao longo de sua carreira, a VIE aconselhou governos estrangeiros, bancos de desenvolvimento, agências multilaterais e gerencia os programas internacionais de consultoria e treinamento da IPA. É, eu queria destacar o quanto. Monitoring. E nós somos grandes entusiastas do 5K model, que foi discutido. O Ministério da Economia tem sido um dos parceiros nessa missão. A Corte tem alguns colegas que estão fazendo o treinamento. And we need to learn and do our homework to contribute with our objective, which is monitor the public administration. I'd like to lend the floor to Javier Encinas, please. You have 20 minutes to present. Good morning, everyone. Muito obrigado ao TCU e ao governo brasileiro por me convidar a me juntar nesse painel prestigioso. E eu sei que vocês querem aprender com o 5K model para a aprovação de propostas. Muito obrigado, Nicolá, Rafael, Pedro, ao Ben. My name is Javier Encinas. I'm the deputy head of the international team. We are part of the Project and Structured Finance Group at the Infrastructure and Projects Authority. So let me just try to move to the next slide. There you go. So allow me just to, to spend, you know, two minutes just to, to, to say a few words about my unit. The IPA is the UK government center of expertise for infrastructure and major projects. We sit at the heart of government reporting to the Treasury, our Ministry of Economics and Finance, but also to the Cabinet Office, the Ministry of the Prime Minister and the Cabinet. The IPA works in a matrix model with teams composed of a range of technical, commercial, finance, legal and policy experts. About 70% of the people working with us, uh, you know, they come from, from the private sector, they have private sector uh, uh, background and 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 30 percent they have a a, a public uh, service uh, background so we are generally a public private unit and we work with government and industry to both support individual major projects but our main role is to build the best performing project system in the world and to do that we focus on on the three piece of project delivery and they are very closely aligned to what uh, uh, professor fuba uh, mentioned uh, so the principles to get the basics right from the beginning for every project, people to build strong, flexible, professional and capable teams and performance to ensure that our projects are delivering their expected outcomes to the time and the budget agreed. So please, if you would like to know more about the work we do in the IPA, visit our website and I leave uh, our link there uh, should you want to, uh, to see a bit more of what we do. Now let me let me let me now talk about the five case model. And I can I can spend hours uh, talking about the five case model because it's really the backbone of our project development system. 
The five case model is a management tool for preparing, appraising, and approving investment proposals. And by investment proposals, I mean anything that involves public money, taxpayers' money, whether that's the development and implementation of a policy or the development of a program or the delivery of a project. You know, if it involves public money in the UK, it has to use the five case model. So it's a mandatory tool. And it has the following characteristics that makes it you know, quite special. So first of all, it's a structured tool because it shows in a step-by-step -step way what to do and more importantly, how to do it. So it tells people, you know, those pre presenting their proposals, you know, what we expect from them. And also it tells them, you know, how to do that. So it tells them, for example, how to conduct, conduct a value for money analysis, a cost benefit analysis, how to do a proper risk allocation matrix, uh, and so on. Second, it's a multidimensional tool because it covers in a holistic way all the steps through five key lenses or dimensions, the strategic, economic, commercial, financial, and management. And I will come back to those in a minute. It's an iterative tool because it analyzes all these five dimensions at the same time, simultaneously, because they are closely linked. So if something changes in one of the dimensions, we have to go back to the other four because they are interlinked. It's multi-stage because we develop the analysis in three main stages. And those stages, we call them the strategic, the outline, and the full business case. In our international version, we call them the initial, intermediate, and full business case. So it's like writing the story of your project in three terms. It's still the same project. Is the same story, but you write it, you know, over time, as you get more and more information. So finally, it is a dynamic, a living do document that accompanies the civil servant in the development of the project throughout its life cycle, from the moment it's that project is conceived through to the end of that project. So the main objective of the five case model is to ensure that the right projects are selected and delivered in the right way. And this is very, very important. And I'll come back to that also in a second. So that is the structure of the five case model. Um, as I said before, it's all is based on five key dimensions and each dimension asks a key question to the project. So the first dimension is the strategic case. And that asks the question very important, is this project necessary? So to start with it, we have to understand what the problem that we want to address is. We really have, have to have a good understanding of what's the problem that we want to solve. Because sometimes, you know, we don't need to invest in infrastructure to address that problem. Sometimes we only need to better utilize the asset that, you know, we want to, we, we, we want to, 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 to change. Sometimes we don't need to invest in new infrastructure. Sometimes it's just better to refurbish, rehabilitate, expand the existing assets. And sometimes we do need to invest in new infrastructure, but we have to understand you know, what the problem is so that we can understand if the project we want to develop is really a necessary project. And we all know that you know, our needs are huge, our resources are very limited. That's why you know, asking that question is so important. Is a project necessary? The second dimension is the economic case. And that case asks the question, is this project desirable from a value for money standpoint? So here I have two sub questions. The first sub question is, what is the best project option to address that problem that I raised in this strategic case? So assuming that the problem I want to solve is to, for example, link up two regions, region A to region B. So the best project option could be a road, could be a train, could be an urban transport project, for example, a tram. Um, or sometimes your, your choice is, is, is not as wide. Sometimes it's all about, you know, a variance of that same project, for, for example, having two lanes or four lanes or six lanes. But this is all about the project, best project option. Okay. And that's a separate question to the second question, which is, what is the best procurement route option to deliver that best project option. Okay, so once you have found the best project option, now you can ask the question, what's the best way of delivering it? Is it through the traditional way, public works, or is it better to do it as a PPP? For example, as a concession PPP, or as a, a PFI type of PPP, or a strategic alliance, or a joint venture, etc. Okay, so two separate questions, best project option and best procurement route option. 
The next case is a commercial case. And that case asks the question, is this project commercially viable or bankable, we may say. And again, two sub-questions. The first question is, is the private sector interested in my project? And the second sub-question, can the private sector deliver my project? So here I'm testing the capacity and the appetite of the private sector to design, construct, uh, finance, operate and or maintain my infrastructure. The next case is the financial case. And that case asks the question, is the project financially affordable? So again, two questions. The first one is, how much does it cost to deliver and maintain that project? And these are whole life costs. So this is the cost, the capex, the opex, the financial cost, interest on the debt, uh, return on the equity, inflation over 25 years. Okay, it, it covers a whole project life cycle. In a way, that's an easy question. That's a question related to the financing. You know, how much does it cost to deliver that project? But the difficult question linked to that first question is, how am I going to pay for that infrastructure? And this is the funding question. So most countries, they focus on the financing question. How much will it cost? And that's, in a way, an easy question. I can hire some cost consultants. They can give me, you know, a capex estimates, opex estimates, financial cost estimates. But the important thing is, how am I going to pay for that infrastructure? Is that through taxpayers' money? or through user payments, or through you know, more innovative ways like uh, uh, land value acquisition, or through uh, third party income uh, streams. So again, you know, two very, very important questions. And the final case asks the question, is this project deliverable with the resources available to the authority? And again, extremely important, because here I'm asking the question, is the authority resourced to deliver that project? And by resource, I mean, does it have the required manpower, the required people? Does it have the required budgets? Does it, ha does it have a credible timetable? Does it have people, money, and time to deliver the project? So by asking those five key questions, you know, I can ensure that my project is necessary, desirable, viable, commercially, financially affordable, and deliverable. So now, if we talk about the benefits of the five case model, uh, the first and most important benefit is that it provides a common framework. Common framework to everybody involved in the project development process. Those involved in the identification and selection of the project, those involved in the preparation of that project, those involved in the appraisal and approval of that project, those involved in the delivery, and finally those involved in the auditing of that project. In the UK, everyone, public and private sector, we all use the same framework, you know, the five case model. And that framework gives us the transparent scoping, planning and preparation for spending proposals. So we use it, you know, to prepare projects, but we also use it to scrutinize appraise and approve those projects. So here in the UK, the preparation and the project appraisal and approval phase is just, you know, two, two sides of the same coin. You know, they all use the same framework. You know, it also helps us, uh, you know, make decisions based on evidence, uh, manage risks in a better way. And very importantly, it also gives us all the information we need to be prepared for an audit. You know, it gives us the audit trail that auditors, you know, like TCU, you know, require to properly audit, you know, a project, focusing on the right questions, on the right structures. Okay, so the five case model, if you like, is like the DNA of my project. You know, it has the whole history of my project, the justification of the project, you know, and the reasons why I decided to do that or that project. So in sum, this five case model provides transparency, consistency, and continuity to both the public and the private sector. Transparency, because it tells everyone, you know, what they need to do and how they need to do it, you know, to prepare a project, to appraise and approve a project. Consistency, because, because everyone knows that that framework is used for every project in every sector across the whole country. And continuity, because everyone knows that that's something that we have used in the past, that we're using now, and that we will be using 
in the future. So transparency, consistency, and continuity, very important. Now, the five case model is, is also very easy to adapt, to adopt, to improve, because it's scalable, it's flexible, it's efficient, it's effective, and it's best practice. You know, uh, the G20, for example, recognizes it as the gold standard for project development. Now, let me now talk about the Colombian experience in adapting, adopting, and promoting the five case model. But be, be, before I, I go into 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 Colombia, let me let me say a few words about the global infrastructure program, which is a program that allowed us to work, you know, with our partner countries uh, and bring the five case model and prioritization roadmap and BIM, you know, to 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 all these partners. So the Global Infrastructure Program, or GIP, is a technical cooperation scheme in infrastructure uh, and is funded by the UK government's Prosperity Fund. This is a massive uh, pot of money, 1.2 billion, perhaps a little bit less now, that uh, supports uh, global, regional and bilateral programs. And our program, the GIP, is the only infrastructure-specific global program supported by uh, the Prosperity Fund. And our program is implemented by us, the Infrastructure and Projects Authority, and remember that we report to both the Treasury and Cabinet Office, but also by the FCDO, our uh, Ministry uh, of Foreign, Commonwealth and Development, uh, um, and BASE, our Department for Business, Environment and Industrial Strategy. So this is truly a cross-Whitehall, a cross UK government initiative, uh, and we support partner countries through the development and adaptation of tools that we use here in the UK to develop infrastructure. And by tools, I mean three main tools, the five case model that you all know, but also project initiation roadmap, which is our tool for initiating projects and BIM, building information modeling. We also support countries through capacity building and accreditation because we believe that the functions of project developer, project appraiser, and project approver, they have to be uh, standardized. They have to be accredited internationally. And finally, in the case of Colombia and Indonesia, we also provide technical and financial support for the development of real projects using the five case model and prioritization roadmap. So, in a nutshell, the GIP's main objective is to help partner countries transform their infrastructure systems. And by doing that, we want to promote inclusive economic growth, reduce poverty, support gender and inclusion, and increase private investment and business opportunities you know, with our partners. Now, let me, let me move on to the next slide, uh, which is all about you know, Colombia. So you may ask the question, why Colombia? Why did we decide to, to, uh, to use Colombia as a pathfinder, as a pilot for the whole of Latin America as part of the Global Infrastructure Program? Well, first of all, because, because we have a long and successful track record of working on infrastructure-related matters with Colombia. We've been working with them for over 12, 12 years. Uh, we know them really well, they know us really well, and we know we can work together really well. Um, also, Colombia is an ideal partner from an economic, political, institutional, and trade investment point of view. As you all know, Colombia is the fourth largest economy in Latin America. It has a history of economic growth and political stability. Uh, it has a robust civil service. Uh, it has developed the 4G program, one of the most sophisticated PPP programs in the region. And it has huge potential for trade and investment underpinned, of course, by the peace process. However, as we all know, a huge challenges remain in Colombia, which meant that our program could really add value to the country. Uh, for instance, Colombia has a highly devolved governance system whereby regional, uh, local uh, uh, authorities, they have uh, a lot of responsibility over planning, delivery and spending, but they often lack the corresponding financial and technical resources to undertake those roles. Um, also, the tools and the processes, the project documentation used in Colombia throughout the project development cycle is quite variable, which often results in high transaction costs, ill-prepared projects, time and cost overruns, and also endless renegotiations post-contract award with the private sector. So that means that the standardized five-case model approach, and more generally, the standard approach of the GIP tools, prioritization roadmap, BIM, and five-case model, they can bring transparency, consistency, and continuity to the project 
development process in Colombia. And by doing that, we hope to bring down transaction costs, speed up delivery, and ensure better quality infrastructure in Colombia. And finally, that may help unleash the uh, trade and investment potential that Colombia has. Now, in terms of impact and legacy, we've been working through the GIP with Colombia for three and a half years now. Um, and, 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 and legacy for us has been, you know, the most important thing from day one. You know, we keep asking ourselves, what are we going to leave behind, you know, once the program is over? And I think we're leaving behind, you know, quite, quite, a, quite a lot of, uh, uh, of legacy. So first of all, we developed a Colombia specific version of the 5 case model guidance, case study, templates, technical notes, training materials, and training approach. So everything has been adapted to the Colombian environment, has been translated into Spanish, and we can deliver now training uh, in Spanish uh, directly online and, and if possible, face to face. Uh, we have also built a lot of uh, capacity in the country. We have trained formally and informally hundreds of key decision makers and senior officials, and that's to help them understand, adapt, adopt, and promote the program tools. Um, also, very interestingly, um, as we speak, we are working with the Inter-American Development Bank on the development of an e-learning platform that will combine face-to-face -face and online training to continue training and certifying people in Colombia, in the region, and also internationally. We are also setting up uh, a pre-investment fund, and this is really exciting, uh, uh, and that with FDN, Colombia's Infrastructure Development Bank, and with the Inter-American Development Bank. We are developing a pre-investment fund to support the development of infrastructure in Colombia, following the principles, and this is quite important, of technical ex excellence, gender equality, social inclusion, and environmental protection. So, uh, so again, you know, this is, this is quite exciting for us. We have uh, planned a launch event on uh, Tuesday, the 10th of November via Zoom at 9 a.m. Colombia time, 11 a.m. Brasilia time, 2 p.m. UK time. Um, and as part of that launch event of that uh, pre investment fund, we'll have a panel discussion with FDN's president, with IDB's president, with IPS chief executive officer. Possibly we'll have also ministerial attendance from the UK and Colombia. Uh, so, so I'm sure we'll have a very interesting session where panelists will talk about how the fund can be a catalyst for infrastructure investment, economic recovery, industrial transformation, social inclusion, and environmental protection. So all of these are key and relevant topics in the COVID-19 situation that we're all living in. So we'll make sure that we, we send you the invitation either via our community of practice, and I will talk about that in a second, or through our embassies network. So remember, 10th of November, 11 a.m. Brasilia time. Um, as part of the GIP and our legacy, we also developed a community of practice. It's a LinkedIn group to connect people across the world who have participated in our project initiation roadmap and five case model training as part of the UK government's global infrastructure program. And through that community of practice, we want to share uh, data, information, best practice, events, training possibilities, you know, for our community members. So uh, um, at the end of my presentation, I will leave you a link and I hope you will all, you know, join uh, our community of practice. Um, so through the program, uh, we think that we have developed a sustainable, replicable and scalable solution that can be applied in other countries, in other regions and in different programs. So we really hope that if our bid proposal to extend our pro program for an extra three days three years, sorry, is, uh, is successful, you know, we'll be able to work uh, with Brazil as closely as we have done with uh, Colombia. So we hope that uh, in three years time, we'll be able to talk about Brazilian uh, five case model materials and, and pre initiation roadmap materials, uh, that we can talk about a pre-investment fund. Uh, and, and I know that we have had conversations with the Ministry of the Economy, with uh, BNDS, with Caixa, and they have shown, you know, quite a lot of interest in, in developing, you know, a similar facility uh, for Brazil. So, so what are the lessons that we have learned uh, that can be used in other countries? Well, over the past uh, three and a half years, we have learned that uh, a successful program, such as the Global Infrastructure Program, uh, relies on, first of all, adopting an efficient delivery model, combining UK global and local expertise. In our case, that involved us, the IPA, you know, working directly with our partners. So we were at the heart of that delivery. 
of, of the program. We uh, did a lot of visits to Colombia, but also to Brazil, to Peru, to Mexico, to Indonesia, to Vietnam. Uh, we also had some you know, local presence. We have 10 members based in the UK embassies, mainly in Colombia and Indonesia. Uh, and we hired some uh, local consultants uh, with the right uh, balance of local, regional and international expertise. Second, we know it's important to choose the right partners and work closely with them in the design, implementation and the monitoring of the program. In the case of Colombia, we chose uh, Financiera de Desarrollo, which is the uh, Colombian Infrastructure Development Bank. They have great reputation for technical excellence and also they are committed to raising the uh, social and environmental standards in, in Colombia. So we worked closely with FDN in the adaptation of the tools, in the adoption of those tools, in the delivery of the training, and with them and the IDB, another great partner, we are developing the pre-investment fund that I mentioned before. Uh, uh, thirdly, as I said before, uh, for us, well, it was very important to leave uh, a legacy behind. So we developed an incentives mechanism to embed change, to leave a legacy and to support long lasting impact in our partner countries. Uh, in the case of the GIP, that involved uh, quite a lot of things that involved, first of all, having uh, the tools adapted, translated. We have now the tools in three languages, in English, Spanish and Indonesia, Bahasa. Uh, we also have the community of practice. We also have the e-learning platform to continue sharing best practice and training people even after the end of the program. And, and also we are leaving behind that pre-investment fund that that is scalable, is replicable in other countries. Um, and finally, we have created a lot of links and we exploded synergies between our program and other UK government programs and multilateral initiatives. For example, we linked the GIP to the UK-Brazil economic and financial dialogues, to the UK-Mexico high-level economic talks, to the G20 infrastructure discussions. We also have different multilateral partnerships, not only with IDB, but also with the World Bank and G20. And we are co-funding a lot of projects and activities with, for example, the UK-Colombia bilateral uh, program. So that helps us, you know, uh, raise the profile, the reach and the impact of our program. So my, fi my final slide is, is, is this one. Uh, I just wanted to leave you with uh, the relevant links to the 5K model guidance and training materials in English. Uh, we also have those available in Spanish and in uh, Bahasa Indonesian. Uh, second, uh, we welcome you all uh, in our uh, community of practice is a LinkedIn group. I leave you with the link there. Uh, remember, we'll be sharing a lot of uh, you know data, information, best practice, events, uh, training opportunities through that community of practice. So I'm sure it will be you know very useful. And finally, uh, remember the pre the the GIP FDN IDB pre-investment fund launch event on Tuesday, the 10th of November at 9 a.m. Colombia time, 11 a.m. Brazilian Brasilia time and 2 p.m. UK time. So we hope to see you all there because we also hope to you know, very soon be able to work at that level with Brazil. So thank you very much for your attention. Obrigado. Muito obrigado pelas palavras. Thank you very much, Mr. Javier Encinas. Uh, parabéns pela fala. Muito engrandecedora. Nós temos sido aí um entusiastas do We are enthusiast of the 5K model and we've been looking for in Brazil the court of accounts especially to learn more about successful cases that were implemented. And now I will lend the floor to Pedro the Interim Secretary of the Development Secretary of the Ministry of Economy, Pedro and Diogo, who was on the head of, uh, they've been great partners in the discussion. They've been allowing us in a way to facultate the discussion in the Court of Accounts, and we thank the opportunity to discuss such relevant themes. He's in the career of finances and control of SGI, and he's graduated at WNIB, University of Brazil, and he's a great enthusiast of the team. Pedro, you have the floor, 20 minutes. Para nós é, é, é sempre muito bom trabalhar junto, 
é, infraestrutura, eu sempre falo, né, é, é um tema tão complexo e envolve a participação de tantos atores diferentes que a gente tem que ter o apoio de todos sempre é, para conseguir atingir os nossos objetivos. Né? E, e, Nicola, você disse aí muito bem, somos é, entusiastas do, do 5Ks Model e eu não, não poderia começar a apresentação aqui sem fazer um agradecimento público ao Javier, ao IPA e à Embaixada do Reino Unido por todo o apoio que, que eles têm nos dado para estruturar é, a possibilidade de utilização do 5Ks no Brasil. Temos é, trabalhado em parceria com treinamentos. Em parceria com treinamentos. Eu vi aqui no chat da transmissão do transmission on YouTube. É, isso é fundamental de fato e, e o IPA e, e o Javier pessoalmente tem sido yeah. muito engajado em nos ajudar. Especificamente, é, they, they have been very helpful in the sense we have made some uh, partnership with the federal government and we are starting to keep this network very active. We have groups on WhatsApp with daily discussions and this is fundamental for us to be able to reach our objectives. Can you see my screen, my presentation? Yes, we do, Peter. All right, so let's move on. I'm sorry, can't you see my screen? It's not full screen. No, no, it's not full screen. Not yet. Now it is. Well, I have a, a huge challenge proposed by Nicola, which is to talk about analysis and benefits in 20 minutes or even less now that I have spent some of my time. But my idea here is to show to you and to debate a little bit about how the Ministry of the Economy sees this analysis of cost benefit as a tool to help solve problems and in increase our reach of our objectives. I think that this is the main goal. Analysis of cost benefits like other initiatives They are complementary and fundamental for us to be able to solve problems. Problems that Minister Zimmer, Zimmer made clear very objectively in the presentation of the program. program. Problems that Mr. DiBello also mentioned and Nicola tackled. These are problems with uh, halted constructions, constructions that are not delivering time, constructions that do not uh, deliver value to the society that we need to address solution to. And we know, we've seen along these years, that many are the problems that cause and that culminate with this result. And, and that goes from the planning of the construction or of the portfolio down to the last phase of implementation and uh, implementation and operation. And I highlight the word, uh, I highlight operation because as Nicola said, there are many constructions that we have made, for example, in the health area that we have built and we are not able to operate. So this whole cycle we need to look at. Are these, these are recurrent problems that everybody can see very easily. I mean, we all hear from the standpoint of, this, of the public sector. And of course, everyone from the productive sector that are with us, uh, they have that much more clearer, uh, the impacts of their, because they impact in their activities much more. So I think that these challenges are very clear. And I would like to say, that we understand that this problem is actually bigger. Of course, we need to solve the, the, the ongoing deliveries, but the main diagnosis show that we have a very big gap of infrastructure in Brazil, and this is something that we hear all the time. But when you look at the numbers, that becomes even more clear. When we, I mean, the presentation is not on the screen. Yes, it does. It seems like it's not being broadcast on YouTube. It seems that on YouTube is not there yet. All right, all right, no problem. I think that it will show up now. When we look at the numbers that show this gap, this is very evident. I mean, Brazil has a very low uh, level of infrastructure when you compare with other countries. Brazil has 30% of infrastructure when other countries, developed countries, and even our peers, they have an average of 60% in relation to the GDP. Furthermore, as if that were not enough, 
we invest very little when we compare with other countries, which means that we have less infrastructure than other countries and we invest less than that than them do, which renders the results inevitable, which is a deepening of this comparative difference with other countries, which reflect in our economy in great dimensions. We invest little in comparison with other countries and we also invest little when we compare with our own past. The, towards the end of the seventh decade, the beginning of the the eighty the eighties, we invested a lot more than we invest today. We actually invested between six to seven percent of our GDP, and then we had a trajectory that was very descending. So the average of the last ten years, we've invested something like two percent of the GDP in infrastructure, and so. We have to make it very clear what is our objectives. What are our objectives? We have done a study and published in August of last year, which showed that in order for us to reach a, a storage of infrastructure compatible with the developed countries in 30 years, we would need to triple the investments that we do today immediately, which would mean in transforming the investment that we have today into this green area that we see. In other words, triple now and invest more. And for that, we have great challenges. We know that we have a huge difficulty of increasing the space the, the, over the inspection. So we, we trust a partic private participation of investments in infrastructure. As an example of what happened in energy and telecom after the privatization towards the end of the 70s, of the 90s. When we look at the sector, we see an immediate increase of investments that were made that transformed our infrastructure and that everybody saw, everybody here saw. And this is what we need to do to the other sectors as well. And in order to increase consistently these investments, private investments, we need to build a bunch of solutions. And this bunch of solutions, they have to be based on principles, values, and fundamentals. We cannot have spasms of investments or increase of investments when, we, as we have seen in the recent past. In this sense, many initiatives are ongoing and being executed by the Ministry of the Economy as well as other ministries as well, such as the Ministry of Infrastructure, Communication, Science and Technology, as well as regional development. There are many initiatives. I mean, they are reform, uh, structuring reforms. There are principles that need to be followed. There are simplification and deregulation that we see being published almost daily by many ministries. We have worked a lot to create regimes of authorization for public investments that we allow for an, a storage of infrastructure by the free initiative as an example of the sector of a railway and telecommunications. So furthermore, we are working on reforms from the regulatory framework to break the, the barrier to foreign uh, to inv uh, private investment. And I believe that sanitation is a very clear example of this process. So this is a broad work that needs to be followed. So we believe that the increase in private of private investments is what will allow us to reach that goal. However, we know that a great part of this private investment will depend on a public effort. And what do I mean by public effort? When we talk about concessions and PPA, no PPP, we're talking about the public sector needs to take the initiative of making a concession or making a PPP, public-private partnership. So we need to decide to do that. In residual parcel, a, par a residual parcel of the investment will be executed by the public sector. You know that. But in there is where, I mean, when we depend on this participation of the public sector in the construction of this private investment, that's where the importance of cost analysis benefit 
cost analysis of the benefit is necessary. And it is fundamental to guide the decision of public uh, decision maker. This is a tool that will allow us to measure from the perspective of the society the monetary value of the benefits of each project. This will allow for a comparison and facilitate the decision making. So we're going to have the difference between the analysis, the, the private and public uh, cost analysis. And the difference is in the cost, in the social cost, we look from the perspective of the society. So we are incorporating monetarily uh, the indirect decision, I mean, the, 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 the externalities that we are not able to measure. So this is... Uh, this has uh, an effect, a positive effect, and it helps to solve problems that were cited here along the debates in a much more relevant fashion. So this should guide the public sector in this decision of structuring of projects. We have human resources and financial resources that are scarce, evidently, so we need to have <clears throat> we have to work hard to have consistency in this decision-making processes and move on. And why is this so relevant? What are the evidences that show us that? Well, we have a bunch of diagnoses that show that the good assessment and the selection of projects, they have a very significant impact on the effect that the investment generates for the society. And it is evident that we have deficiencies in these phases. They are uh, reports. There are studies from the IMF and the World Bank and OECD. I mean, they are accordance from the courts of accounts that actually make it very evident of how much we need to move forward in this path. And here we can notice how much it is different. When I make an investment on projects that generate a greater return to the society, I end up having a greater impact on the economy that is a lot more significant. So what we defend here is that the analysis of cost-benefit is one of the factors that should be taken into account or one of the main factors that should be taken into account for the decision of the decision makers so we can avoid problems that we've had in the past. As ACB is used by many countries in the selection of these investments, we have the example of Chile, which is a, case, a very successful case, as well as a benchmark for all of us in the region. The European Union also has its guide in the United Kingdom Ditto. So our idea for the analysis of cost and benefit is to create this environment of discussions and the standardization of this analysis so that we can use that consistently and in a way that is perennial a long time. We have worked very hardly with the government center, uh, with the chief of staff, as well as within the Ministry of the Economy and sectorially in the construction of the method, I believe that we must not think too much when of the execution of the projects. We need to work on the methods, have the methodology available, and make sure that everybody works in a, in a factory of sausage. That's the example we use. We have to have the studies previously defined. We need to validate this methodology and start to apply them largely, as we have seen in the beginning. Our challenge in terms of size of investment is gigantic. And this process of standardization of standards is, is not trivial. So we are building this in, with many partnerships. We have some consultings that we have hired. We have the support of IPEA. So we have a bunch, a bunch of discussion, a network of discussions to do this kind of analysis. And our idea is to publish a guide of analysis of cost benefit for infrastructure that can be applied to all of the big projects of infrastructure. And in that sense, we have worked, we have moved on. And last year, we did a study. And 
which is basic for the analysis of costs and benefits of the projects. And we've done a public survey on the general guide of costs and benefits. The next steps in that regard are the sectorial manuals. And these are, they are being elaborated in, in collaboration with the ministries. The idea is to have all of these perimeters pre-established so we're able to use this analysis of costs and benefits and when to use. I mean, we like to work on this cycle of the investment since the planning down to the assessment of the results just to try to address solutions for the problems that happen in the different phases of the problem, I mean, of the project. And in this phase of planning, that's where ACD has a greater potential of helping us. That's where we are going to identify the best solutions for the problems that are diagnosed. So the, minist the secretarial ministry in the face of, in a, in a planning phase, if they use ACB as a guide of the choice of the best solutions, they will ensure that the unfolding of the structuring of this project down to the execution be facilitated enormously. And of course, an ACB, an analysis of cost and benefit, uh, in the moment of structuring of the project, that will confirm if the perception that we had in the planning is de facto true. And, and so on and so forth. So I, I, I reiterate regarding 5Ks. I think that the infrastructure of how the, the logic of 5Ks looks at this big cycle and helps us a lot. So we see the analysis of cost and benefit within the infrastructure of the five cases of the project to contribute to this delivery in time with the benefits that were in fact estimated as well as in the cost that was projected. So the analysis of cost benefits is one solution or a tool that comes along with other tools so that we can deliver that which we need to deliver. So in a nutshell, this long-term vision, in other words, the use of ACB in a plan phase will help to attract, to, to draw this international investor because it will render transparency to all the investors of what are the best projects and how we are making this implementation. And so, again, I talked about the analysis of cost benefit, which is together along with a bunch of other initiatives. And here, just a short summary of what we have done, I mean, myself and all the other ministries, for everyone to understand where this fits in. As I said in the beginning, the designs of markets are important for us to attract these investment. The methodologies, both of analysis of cost and benefits and as well as the five case models are complementary, as well as the design of the catalog of perimeters that we are developing together. The Observatory of Infrastructure, which is an initiative that we are doing along with the Ministry of, of, of along with the Ministry of the Economy and the other ministry to bring more transparency to the information that we have on infrastructure. Today the ba the database that we have today are all very spread out. So those that need to make decisions considering data in spite of being public public data, they have a difficulty of gathering the data. So our goal is to put all the data in a single place, like a, re a, reser uh, a reservoir, a repository of data. For example, in the area of logistics, we have a more, a greater uh, consolidation in energy data. So the idea is to have a single database where all the information is put in so that we can allow for more transparency of this uh, initiative. Of course, the structuring of projects, just as, as everybody sees, is an effort that the federal government has made to improve the participation of uh, private investment so that we can start to go up the ladder of growth of investments in infrastructure. We have a project of partnership that today is much greater than we had in the past. So we have a structure of structuring of projects being developed to help the ministries from the standpoint of the federal government, but also the subnational 
I also I've also seen uh, dialogues or chat uh, or me messages on chat where people are concerned about infrastructure and partnership. We have started we have in started partnerships in that sense, and we agree 100 percent with that. So the fund of structuring up projects, which is administered by Kaisha and s overseen by the secretary of PPI is an initiative is an example of that so the idea is to fuse the practices of concessions in partnership for states and municipalities and of course it makes no sense that all municipalities have a structure that is able to do these structurings we need to have gains gains in scale and we need to be able to ensure that the experiences be shared and so capacity building I, I mean, I've seen that concern, and that is a factor. And Javier, once again, has helped us a lot in that sense, as well as ENAPI, the National School of Public Administration, and IDB, as well as many other stakeholders that know the importance that capacity building has so that we can build solidity to this process of reassessment of how to make investments in infrastructure. Court of Accounts can be a very important player in that sense because it has a structure that is very willing and able and very well prepared to make this dissemination of knowledge. And we have other initiatives. The Mi Minister Zimmer said in the beginning about constructions, which has always been a determination of the Ministry uh, of of. The mean of the court of accounting that will be fundamental in 2021, and this is basic because we don't have the information, not even to assess that which we are executing executing consistently. So many initiatives have been made. We've done along with uh, the uh, with CGU regarding uh, halted constructions. And so we need to work in that sense. And there, is, there are two initiatives that are extremely important. One is the long-term vision. In last week, President Bolsonaro signed a decree that created a committee that will unify the planning of infrastructure. This is uh, something that we defend since the beginning of this administration. And it has the role that is a, a very important role to play in the sense of attracting foreign investments. We need to use all of the information that we have. For example, we have a lot of uh, sectorial plans that are well built, but they work with a timeline that is different. They use uh, economical premises that are different. So the idea is to bring everything to a same database, incorporate better practices that we see in other countries or recommendations by OECD, so that we can put it in a way that the public manager can make the decision that generate more impact to the society. In that sense, a uh, point that we need to bear in mind, and that was mentioned here, and Javier mentioned it, as well as Professor Philibian, governance. Well, governance is important so that we are able to start from the standpoint of planning for that, which we believe is the solution for the problems, to the implementation and avoid a bunch of problems that we have seen of constructions that start and never end. So governance of how to start investments has to be discussed and has to be improved continuously. This is one of the challenges that the Ministry of the Economy, along with the sectorial ministries, have done along this period. And we need to deliver that in a much closer future. So in a very short fashion, this is what I have to say. And I would like to highlight a point that I believe it's fundamental. We have a great opportunity to transform uh, our infrastructure. Today, we have teams that are brilliant, not only in the Ministry of the Economy, but also in other ministries, such as my, uh, my, uh, mining and energy. The ministries that work more directly with infrastructure, we have very well organized and well structured teams. So we need to take advantage, we need to take momento, look at what's been wrong in the past and build differently. I believe that in that sense, the Court of Account is always a great partner and we need to work a lot with the analysis that you do. We understand that even though sometimes you are tough, 
there is a lot to be learned. So thank you very much, Nicola. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Zimler. These opportunities are always great times for discussions. Thank you. Pedro, muito obrigado pela fala, pela apresentação. Minister Zimler needed to, la to leave. There will be a series of processes that we'll, he will work on today. So uh, it's a privilege to be able to hear you and to learn from you, sharing your knowledge with our team here at the Court of Accounts and so many other colleagues that are online with us today via the internet. I would like to thank Mr. Pedro Capilupi, not only for his participation, but also for the great partnership that he brings in these discussions on issues of infrastructure. Mr. Javier, great enthusiast of the five case models we've been participating. Uh, in the trainings and we want to invest more so that the court can uh, take advantage of this knowledge to increase in the improvement of public administration. So we want to learn more and share this knowledge in our works by sharing the knowledge that we have learned. With that, we'd like to wish you all a wonderful afternoon, a wonderful week of work, and thank you all for your participation in, with the great subject that was discussed and the elements of quality that